Welcome back, everybody, to our uh, sixth session of the conference, Joining the Circle of the System, Philosophy and Being. Uh, today, I am, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker, Sebastian Stein, who is uh, right now doing a PDFG postdoc with a project about metaphilosophy with, uh, at Heidelberg with Professor Anton Friedrich Koch. And he's also acting secretary for the Hegel Society of Great Britain. Sebastian is uh, very productive and he has published um, a lot of articles on Hegel, uh, political philosophy, and German idealism. And he has uh, edited a um, series of um, collections of essays, two with uh, Joshua Retzel called um, Cambridge Critical Guide to Hegel's Encyclopedia and Hegel's Encyclopedic System. Uh, first one with Cambridge and the other one with Rutledge, both are forthcoming this year. He's also um, edited a collection of essays with Dr. Ivan Boldurev on Hegel's Phenomenologies, Contemporary Approaches to Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, also forthcoming um, with Rutledge this year. He has uh, come out with a, another collection of essays with uh, James Gledhill titled uh, Hegel and Contemporary Political Philosophy Beyond Kantian Constructivism, published with Rutledge um, this year. And then he has done the um, uh, collection with Dr. Tom Brooks titled Hegel's Practical Philosophy on the Normative Significance of Method and System, published with Ox Oxford uh, 2017. Uh, right now, Sebastian is working on a book on Hegel's philosophy of right, particularly on the method and his notion of freedom and free will, and how this plays a foundational role for right and justice. Today, um, Sebastian will present a paper titled Hegel's Notion of Philosophy, the Concept-Based Unity of Self-Referential Universality and Differentiated Particularity. So, that all out the way, um, the, uh, how it will work is, as usual, Sebastian presents his paper around 45, 50 minutes, and then we'll have a Q&A, which um, I'll be moderating. So if you have questions, just use the raise hand function, or if for some reason you cannot find it, then just uh, write in the chat. There will be a handout. I'll uh, post a link to that in the chat just as soon as the talk gets underway. So, without further ado, uh, Sebastian, the uh, floor is yours. Great, uh, thank you very much for this uh, uh, generous introduction and um, yeah, also to the organizers in general for allowing me to be part of this uh, uh, very helpful and instructive series I had the pleasure to participate in before, um, uh, passively. And yeah, and also uh, thank you and hello to everybody who has <laughs> heeded my call of shameless self-promotion. <laughs> but yeah, it's very nice to see uh, so many uh, uh, good, good friends. Um, Okay, um, yeah, uh, I would like uh, to introduce the uh, notion of um, philosophy and uh, to what degree Hegel uh, presents it as a, a special kind of relationship between the philosophical thinker and the kind of unconditioned truth that he thinks philosophy should convey. And um, I'm going to go about this in two parts. Uh, the first part, part uh, contrasts Hegel's notion of philosophy uh, with those um, of the substance metaphysicians Aristotle and Spinoza. Um, I think we've heard some arguments that somehow Hegel is, is very uh, close to Neoplatonism. And, and I would like to stress the kind of more post-Kantian kind of uh, dimension of Hegel's thought, uh, especially how he tries to uh, defend individual autonomy uh, and therefore also the ability of the individual philosopher to self-determine and actually the need to be self-determining when doing philosophy. And therefore also maybe to be disagreeing uh, even with Hegel. <laughs> um, also aim to show, yeah, um, that Hegel therefore tries to uh, retain some of Kant's and Fichte's insights um, into the notion of individual autonomy, and whilst at the same time doing something they have not done, which is embedding uh, this uh, kind of notion of individuality of a philosophical thinker in the metaphysical context of uh, spirit or what he calls uh, Geist. And in the second part, um, I'll try to analyze Hegel's reasons for deducing a philosophical uh, definition of what philosophy is within his philosophical system. So I thought it was quite curious and interesting that Hegel, as far as I know, um, is the only philosopher that uh, tries to 
um, philosophically deduce a notion of philosophy within a philosophical system. I mean, other philosophers have given definitions of philosophy within uh, their systems, uh, Spinoza, for example, or if one wants to reconstruct Aristotle in this way. But, um, but Hegel actually tries to deduce uh, philosophy um, as a notion, as a philosophical notion in a philosophical manner within the system. And I thought this was quite uh, novel and maybe worthwhile in, uh, looking at what his motives for that were. Okay, I'm gonna read um, the first few quotes, um, just assuming not everybody has access to the handout yet. Um, yeah. And then maybe I'll skip the later ones and just refer to the handout. Okay, um, in the uh, early and the final paragraphs of the encyclopedia, Hegel discusses his notion of philosophy, that's quote one. Philosophy is unified into the simple spiritual intuition and then elevated in it to self-conscious thinking. This knowledge is thus the thinkingly um, cognized concept of art and religion in which the diversity um, in the content is cognized as necessary and this necessity is cognized as free. Uh, crucially, Hegel states that while it is partly true to think of philosophy as the activity of finite historically situated thinkers that have um, intuitions, form representations, and finally comprehend concepts, the philosophical definition of philosophy describes it as the self-comprehension of the unconditioned um, and universal truth, what Hegel calls the idea. Uh, this is quote, uh, quote two. The idea is the adequate concept, the objectively true, or the true as such. If anything has truth, it has it uh, by virtue of, the, of its idea, or something has truth only in so far as it is idea. The idea, and thus truth, is defined by self-adequacy in form of the dynamic unity of its two opposing dimensions, subjectivity um, and objectivity. And this is quote uh, three. And yeah, soon it will be a lot less quotes, I promise. The identity of the idea with itself is one with the process the thought that liberates actuality from the seeming of purposeless mutability and transfigures it into idea must not represent this truth of actuality as dead repose or mere picture, numb without impulse and movement as a genius or number or as an abstract thought. The idea because of the freedom which the concept has attained in it also has the most stubborn opposition within it. Its repose consists in the assurance and the certainty with which it eternally generates that opposition and eternally overcomes it and in it rejoins itself. This seems to place Hegel in opposition to individuality focused uh, thinkers of the same idealist tradition, such as uh, Kant, Fichte and partly Schelling, insofar as these are committed to a notion of irreducible individuality. To them, philosophy is primarily something undertaken by individual thinkers. In contrast, Hegel's account seems closer to those of the naturalist essentialists, Aristotle and Spinoza, who define philosophy as the self-reference of a universal principle, they call God or substance or nature, or as an individual's participation in such self-reference. For example, Aristotle defines philosophy as God's self-thinking, in which the finite thinker can participate, while Spinoza defines it, uh, describes it as God's self-reference, of which the finite thinker is a part. It seems that to them and to Hegel, the philosophical activity of finite thinkers is an expression, instantiation or appearance of an unconditioned, all-determining universal principle that is defined by self-referentiality. And yet, Hegel argues that Spinoza's uh, objective, that is naturalistic or essentialist account of philosophy, unduly prioritizes the unconditioned universality of substance, nature or God over the particularity of the philosophical thinkers and thereby undermines the latter's reality. Since the self-causing of Spinoza's God determines all finite entities he calls modes, and thus also the particular philosophers, it renders them conceptually redundant. In truth, they are God, so that philosophy is only God's self-reference and nothing else. On Hegel's reading, this deprives God's universality of a conceptual means of contrast, and thus of its own determination as universality. Spinoza's supposedly universal God is not non-particularity because all that truly is on God's ontological level is God's own universality. There's only God and everything that seems not to be God is God. However, Hegel argues that Spinoza's God's all-encompassing particularity undermining nature cannot be the universality it is supposed to be because it can only be determined as such in contrast to particularity one cannot comprehend universality in the manner Spinoza demands 
when he argues that the principle of sufficient reason rules over reality unless universality is defined as non-particularity. However, at the ontological level of God, this contrast is impossible if particularity is reduced to God. Not only are all the thoughts of finite philosophers as determined, um, uh, determined as God, sorry, as determined as God is because they are it, God, thus undermining particular thinkers' self-determination, but in dissolving the particularity of the very entities it supposedly determines, Spinoza's God abolishes itself. This is quote four. Absolute indifference may seem to be the fundamental determination of Spinoza's substance. This is indeed the case to the extent that every further concrete differentiation of thought and extension, etc., are posited as vanished. It is simply a matter of indifference what anything might have looked like in existence before being swallowed up in this abyss of abstraction if one stops short at it. Substance ought not to remain Spinoza's substance, the sole determination of which is the negative uh, one that everything is absorbed into it. Differentiation occurs with Spinoza quite empirically, attributes, thoughts, and extension, and then modes, effects, and all the remaining. The differentiation falls to the intellect, itself a mode. The connection of the attributes to substance and to each other says no more than they express the whole of substance. That their content, the order of things as extended and as thoughts, is this same substance. Uh, quote end. From Hegel's point of view, Spinoza thus fails to appreciate that there can be no purely universal self-thinking in the manner um, Spinoza attributes to God that does not undermine particular philosophers' thinking activity and thus itself. Meanwhile, um, Hegel maintains that Aristotle's notion of philosophy fails to explain how philosophers participate in God's self-comprehension. Um, I do uh, realize there's many readings of Aristotle and there's a great deal of literature, especially about the self-thinking of God and, and one's participation in it. Um, and I, I just consci consciously went for, for this line because I thought it seemed to be most truthful to what I perceive to be uh, Aristotle's concern with the irreducibility of particularity. Um, so yeah, Aristotle is not able to uh, explain how philosophers participate in God's self-comprehension, despite Aristotle's uh, uh, claims that they do. Since Aristotle begins with the difference between particular thinkers and universal God, universal God's self-thinking must remain something else and thus inaccessible to the particular thinkers. And thinkers' participation in divine self-thinking uh, becomes inexplicable. Once thinkers and God are defined as different, no subsequent identity claim can unite them and render their identity actual rather than merely possible. We can think along with Aristotle's God, Aristotle's God, but we never do. Despite Aristotle's claims to the contrary, his thinkers may thus try or strive to identify with God's self-thinking, but they cannot succeed. For the thinker's participation in divine self-comprehension to be actual, their finite minds would have to turn out to be God's infinite mind. To Hegel, Aristotle thus undermines the fundamental identity of God and thinker when he avoids a Spinoza-style reduction of finite thinkers within God's universality. However, given Spinoza's problem of universality self-undermining, Aristotle's caution seems understandable. If Aristotle's universal God and its self-thinking were first, and then particular philosophers would be declared identical with it in virtue of their philosophical activity, the thinkers would ultimately be God, thus losing their particularity and along with it, their claim to self-determination or even existence. Prioritizing God's universal self-thinking over the finite thinkers would mean that the thinkers' activity could be explained away with reference to God. In truth, their thinking would be God's, and since God's self-causing is all there is, there would be no discernible self-motivated activity by finite thinkers. Again, this would undermine God's universal status by depriving it of a means of contrast. While Hegel's Aristotle is able to avoid such reduction of the thinker's particularity, he does so at the cost of undermining the identity between philosophers and God. What is Hegel's um, constructive alternative to these essentialist uh, definitions of philosophy? In the encyclopedia, Hegel defines philosophy as a unity of universal and thus self-referential truth and particular thinkers. This unity is based on the structure of the aforementioned idea and thus Hegel's definition of truth as such. The idea, however, is defined as a form of what Hegel defines as the most fundamental ontological principle that determines all thought and being and which he calls the concept. Uh, this is quote five. As the absolute form itself, the concept is every determinacy but in the way that it is in its truth. Although it is abstract, therefore, it is also what is concrete and indeed 
it is what is altogether concrete, subject as such. And quote six, as the substantial might, uh, might, sorry, as the substantial might, which is for itself, the concept is what is free. And since each of its moments, universality, particularity, and individuality, is the whole that it is, and is posited as inseparable unity with it, the concept is totality. Thus, um, in its identity with itself, it is what is in and for itself determinate. The idea is generated by the concept when the subjective concept actively turns itself into objectivity by negating itself and then unites itself with this objectivity to form the idea. This is quote seven. The idea is the absolute unity of concept and objectivity. Its ideal content is nothing but the concept in its determinations. Its real content is only the presentation that the concept gives itself in the form of external awareness. And since this figure is included in the ideality of the concept or in its might, the concept pre preserves itself in it. The concept-based idea exists in the three distinct and mutually determining forms of the logical absolute idea as the self-alienated idea as nature and disguise. Uh, that is the idea that has, uh, sorry, and as guys, that is the idea that has returned from and sublated its self alienation. So that's basically what quote eight says. So I'm not going to read it. Designed to track the idea's categorical shape, uh, shapes, the encyclopedia structure thus describes the three forms of the idea, arguing that the logical idea freely manifests as nature and geist, where these forms are required for determining the logical idea to be what it is. The logical idea is determined as logical because it is not nature and not geist. Meanwhile, the idea as geist is defined as not the logical idea and as not nature. While the idea as nature is defined as not geist and not the logical idea. Since all uh, three forms of the idea, they are the same. However, they can only be the same in being three different determinations of the idea as the unifying principle. Hegel thus defines philosophy as the uh, self-comprehension of the idea that traces its own categorical determinations within. This notion of self-comprehension has the circular structure of the logical absolute idea that Hegel defines as self-referring unity of knowing subject and known object. That's um, quote nine. As unity um, of the subjective and the objective idea, the idea is the concept of the idea for which the idea as such is the object and for which the object is itself an object in which all determinations have come together. This unity therefore is the absolute truth and all truth, it is the idea that thinks itself. Uh, yeah, but this is the logical idea. However, um, philosophy's ideal self-reference is more concrete than the logical idea's self-reference because philosophy as a form of absolute geist implies that the idea's uh, forms of nature and geist are part of the self-reference. Where the logic's absolute idea only comprehends itself as logical subject and object, philosophy's idea-based geist comprehends itself as ideal and the idea as logical, natural, and geistic. To Hegel, philosophy thus means that the idea in its form of geist or reason comprehends itself in its logical, natural, and geistige uh, forms, spiritual forms. This is Q10. The most concrete description of philosophy is the idea of philosophy which has self-knowing reason, the absolutely universal for its middle, a middle that divides into mind and nature, making mind the presupposition as the process of the idea's subjective activity and nature, the universal extreme, as the process of the idea that is in itself objective. Hegel argues that this rendering of the relationship between idea, nature, and geist is able to explain why the thinkers, as appearance of geist, can comprehend logic and nature, although logic and nature are not geist. Logical nature, uh, sorry, logical idea, nature, and geist are intelligible to geist, and thus to the philosophers, because all three are expressions of the same principle, that is the idea. Geist and thus the finite philosophers as uh, geistic spiritual thinkers can comprehend the logical idea, nature and geist, because all of these are idea. The unity of the idea's three forms illustrates Hegel's reason why the logical idea posits itself as nature and as geist in the first place. The relationship between the idea and its forms is itself concept-based. Just like the concept's universality negates itself to define particularity, and negates this particularity to form individuality, the idea's immanent concept motivates it to freely negate itself and assume the form of nature to then negate nature to become geist. It thus follows from the idea's freedom that the idea exists as nature and geist. So um, in theology, I guess, one question, why does a perfect, a perfect God create nature and, and um, or uh, even takes a, a Trinitarian form? 
and I, I would think Hegel, um, Hegel's argument would be uh, because God is free. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be this way. It's not necessary, but God is free, and and it's uh, or God's freedom consists in this uh, uh, double uh, self-negation. So while the idea uh, is the one singular ontological principle that defines reality, it freely does so in its forms as logical idea, nature, and Geist. A truly conceptual comprehension of the idea's determinations as uh, logical idea, nature, and Geist thus provides the uh, why explanation regarding the idea's forms. So why do they exist? Uh, because uh, of um, the self-alienation and the self-positing um, that, that is freedom, and freedom is the concept. Hegel's final philosophical description of the encyclopedia's architecture is thus informed by the structure of the concept. The subjective concept freely turns itself into idea and the idea freely turns itself into nature and geist. Within the overarching ideal unity of the idea's three forms, um, the particularity of the forms is maintained. Logical idea, nature and geist are internal particular moments of the overarching conceptual structure provided by the idea's self-reference. The particularization of the idea into logical idea, nature and geist is thus an ideal self-differentiation so that Hegel's encyclopedic system embodies the concept-guided, internally particularized self-reference of the idea. Since the concept defines the idea and Geist, um, uh, sorry, since the concept defines the idea and Geist is one of the idea's forms, Geist is defined by the concept. This also extends to absolute Geist and its determination of philosophy. According to the individuality-based notion of philosophy, the universal dimension of Geist relates to particular philosophers in the same concept-based and thus free manner in which the concept's universality relates to particularity when it forms individuality within uh, which the system's ideal unity relates to its internal particularizations. The free relationship between universality, particularity, and individuality within the concept thus also determines the relationship between the idea's logical, natural, and uh, geistige spiritual forms. Um, and now, um, yeah, this leads to this discussion of um, how the truth or the unconditioned truth of the idea uh, relates to finite thinkers or finite philosophers. This also determines Hegel's account of the relationship between finite philosophical thinkers and unconditioned truth. Given some of Hegel's claims about Geist, one may wonder whether he suggests that finite philosophers simply do what universal Geist does because Geist's universality is causally prior to their particularity. It seems that if this were the case, Hegel would have returned to a variety of what he might call Spinoza's naturalism or essentialism, where finite thinkers are at best passive means and at worst unreal in the face of a presupposed all determining and ultimately self undermining universal principle. Universal principle. However, Hegel insists on the reality and autonomy of particular thinkers in the face of Geist's universality and rejects any notion of their autonomy undermining dependence. Uh, once again, this rejection has its roots in Hegel's uh, concept-based account of the concept's free causality, in contrast to the necessity that he associates with Spinoza's uh, substance, God, or nature. To Hegel, the notion of dependence implies that the difference between particulars, so in this case, the um, geistige thinkers, um, the modi uh, for Spinoza, and the universal principle, uh, Geist's universality, or nature, God, substance for Spinoza, is first, and that the moment's identification comes uh, second. In contrast, Hegel's concept-based based Geist implies that the universal and the particulars are logically simultaneous and differ in this unity. Each moment determines the other and each moment assumes the other's properties without losing its own. Geist's particular thinkers thus relate to Geist's universal dimension, like particularity relates to universality in the logical concept. Um, this is quote 11. The concept's universal is what is identical with itself explicitly in the sense that it contains the particular and the individual at the same time. Furthermore, the particular is what is distinct or the determinacy, but in the sense that it is inwardly universal and is actual as something individual. Similarly, the individual means that it is subject, the foundation that contains the genus and species within itself and is itself substantial. This is the posited unseparateness of the moments in their distinction. The clarity of the concept in which each of the distinctions does not constitute a breach or blurring, but is transparent precisely as such. The concept's identity-based but difference respecting individuality thus accommodates the difference between Geist's universality and finite thinkers as Geist's particularity. 
they, the thinkers, are universal geist, and universal geist is them. Geist universality assumes the properties of the particular thinkers, and they assume geist's properties, the universal dimension of geist, that is. Geist is as particular and thus as concretely manifest as the thinkers. Particular thinkers are as self determining as geist's universality. The unity of these dimensions and thus Geist's true structure is the concept's individuality. Universal Geist's unconditioned universality and the finite thinker's conditioned particularity thus unite to define philosophy as Geist's self-comprehension. Philosophy means that universal Geist comprehends itself, which in turn uh, means that particular Geist thinkers comprehend Geist's universality and their conceptual relationship to it. Since the thinkers are Geist's universality as much as Geist's universality is them, Geist's true individuality is universal and particular at once. With regards to philosophy, this entails that within Geist's free individuality, universal Geist's self-comprehension is the particular thinkers, and the particular, think the particular thinkers' free self-comprehension is Geist's. According to individuality, the particulars are as free as the universal, which is as determined as they are. In and through the finite philosopher's activities, the idea as absolute Geist thus comprehends itself in its purely logical, natural, and geistic forms. They enable it and at the same time, they participate in Geist's self-comprehension so that Geist's self-comprehending activity articulates itself in their self-conscious acts of thinking. Um, this is a quote that's probably not on handout because I haven't given a number. Philosophy is also unified into the simple spiritual intuition and then elevated in it to self-conscious thinking. This knowledge is thus the thinkingly cognized concept of art and religion in which the diversity in the content is cognized as necessary and this necessity is cognized as free. In doing philosophy, the idea as geist and thus the particular philosophers comprehend the idea as nature and as logical absolute idea because all of these are forms of the one idea. And since the idea is universal, the same truth is comprehended by differing particular thinkers. Furthermore, the property transfer from Geist's universal dimension to the particular thinkers and vice versa within the concept's individuality entails that the self-determination rooted in Geist's universality enables the particular thinkers to decide and think autonomously. Their particularity is imbued with Geist's universality and thus incorporates its unconditional self-determination, while universality is concrete thanks to the thinker's particularity. As part of Geist's individuality, particular philosophers are determined and self-determining at the same time. So despite their finitude and determinacy that is rooted in their bodies, their psychology, their historical station, and all other empirical factors, the thinkers are also irreducibly self-determining and thus in control of their thoughts and actions they could always think and do otherwise. This extends to, sorry, this extends to the decision to think philosophically or not. Um, in all given circumstances, the particular philosopher is in principle free to think philosophy's unconditioned truth or to not do so. Um, so we can always freely decide to uh, at least attempt to think unconditioned truth um, or not, irrespective of empirical circumstance and um, similar to, to Kant's uh, account of freedom in the um, groundworks. To Hegel's mind, this concept-based account of philosophy places him in stark contrast to essentialism and thus naturalism, since the ability of Hegel's particular philosophers to decide is neither undermined by a universal principle's overriding causal power, nor are his finite philosophers first differentiated from and thus ignorant of universal truth before being united with it in the manner Aristotle suggests. Instead, the universal dimension of Hegel's Geist and the particular thinkers as Geist's particular dimension are uh, simultaneous so that thinkers and universality constitute each other at once whilst retaining their categorical determinacy within individuality. This also explains Hegel's rejection of the notion that the universal principle uses particulars as mere object-like means. The universal dimension of Geist cannot use finite thinkers as this would imply that the universal dimension and the particular thinkers are fundamentally different. Something can only be used by something else if both are not always already the same. If they were the same, the principle would use itself, which contradicts the notion that the tool uh, depends on the user. The individuality-based identity of thinker's particularity and guides to universality thus entails that when the thinkers decide to think what they do, it is universal guides that determines itself, or 
speculatively equivalent when universal geist determines itself, the particular thinkers decide to think what they think. The particular thinkers are the particularity of geist universality and universality is their ability to self-determine. Their doing is its doing and vice versa. Within this equivalency, the finitude of the particular thinkers and geist universality remain distinguishable. A finite thinker is not all of geist, nor is all of geist a particular thinker, albeit uh, it might be more self-comprehending in some particular thinkers than in others, because some are more willing to think along with the truth uh, of geist. And he, um, of course, implies that somehow, uh, for some reason, well, the reason is his freedom, I guess he would have to say, uh, that, that his uh, philosophical system is, is a closer expression of this willingness and ability to think along with truth uh, than our uh, rival philosophical system. Um, yeah, uh, but how does Hegel argue for the truthfulness of this definition of philosophy? Uh, once, this is the second part now about um, Hegel's um, uh, maybe a strange seeming uh, concept of, of meta philosophy, uh, that is, philosophy as part of the philosophical system. Hegel's answer uh, once more relies on the concept. He gives concept based reasons why the body of concept engendered philosophical knowledge must deduce a definition of what philosophy categorically is. He thus argues uh, first, Philosophy describes uh, truth's uh, self-comprehension. Second, philosophy consists in immediate and mediated, mediated knowledge of this truth. And third, philosophy must deduce that this is what it is and does. So maybe a quite demanding uh, notion of philosophy. To Hegel, a philosophical system that aspires for completeness uh, must thus philosophically prove that a suitable definition of philosophy is part of the system of philosophical knowledge. The system thus contains philosophical knowledge about philosophy so that the philosophical thinker philosophically knows what philosophy is. Hegel argues that this is achieved by showing that the body of philosophical knowledge contains and thus deduces a category of philosophy that follows from the development of the concept in the same manner as all its other categorical determinations. Philosophy must justify itself by deductively placing an account of itself within its own domain of concept-based philosophical knowledge. Um, uh, how does this uh, motivate um, his seemingly meta-philosophical approach? Hegel argues that if philosophy did not define and prove its own categorical meaning, it would not know itself philosophically and thus fail to prove to itself that it is unconditioned knowledge. This amounts to uh, falling short of establishing that its own status as unconditioned knowledge is part of the very unconditioned truth that it is philosophy's task to describe. Without the philosophical proof of philosophy, it would not be established that it is unconditionally true that philosophy articulates unconditioned truth. Failure to do so threatens to undermine philosophy's own necessity and truthfulness. Unless proven otherwise, philosophy's knowledge might not be unconditionally true. This would undermine the standing of all other philosophical categories as they represent the very knowledge that is now questionable. If philosophy is not proven to be unconditionally true, it might be false, which would undermine the status of all philosophical claims. So as long as it is not proven that philosophy is indeed truth's self-knowing, a skeptic could legitimately doubt it. The failure to philosophically deduce the category of philosophy would also affect the epistemic standing of the finite philosopher. Unless philosophy is conceptually proven to be the self-comprehension of truth, the philosopher, the philosopher would not philosophically know that philosophy is true and that he or she is thinking unconditional truth when he or she thinks uh, philosophically. As long as it is not proven to the thinker that philosophy truly is truth's self-reference, he or she does not know so that to him or her, philosophy might not be truth's self-reference um, after all. Um, and the notion can be described in form of a syllogism, which I think is on the handout. Um, first premise, philosophical knowledge is unconditionally true and known to be so. Um, second premise, philosophical knowledge is known as true only if it is philosophically proven. And conclusion, philosophical knowledge must be philosophically proven. Since premise uh, one can only be proven by philosophy, philosophy must prove itself. Another manner of describing uh, this is with reference to the concept of knowledge. If knowledge is a relationship between a subject and an object, 
and philosophical knowledge is supposed to be unconditionally true, both subject and object must have the status of unconditionality and truthfulness. The subject must not err, and the subject must be true content. Were this not the case, it would be possible that either the subject of knowledge is merely particular and thus opinionated, biased, prejudiced, confused, etc., or that the object is but a merely particular content, which by definition could be otherwise. In both cases, knowledge's unconditionality would not be conceptually guaranteed, and it could be the case that what seems to be philosophical knowledge is just opinion. So only if philosophy proves that it is an unconditionally true and thus unerring subject that knows about an unconditionally true object, its status as truth is secured. Similarly, if philosophy is proven to be true, and this proof is part of philosophy, the proof's status as being truthful is proven along with philosophy's other claims. In contrast, should the proof uh, not be part of philosophy, the proof could be questioned and would fail to establish the necessity of the very truth it implies and that it attempts to establish. If a philosophical thinker knew philosophical determinations without knowing that they represent unconditioned knowledge, the known determinations uh, would not be false but they could be questionable to the thinking subject. This means that the subject lacks the status of having unconditional knowledge and does not participate in the unconditioned truth that is required for guaranteeing the unconditioned status of philosophical knowledge. If the subject knew unconditioned truth, it would not doubt. Doubting philosophical truth thus implies that the doubting subject is already detached from unconditioned truth and epistemologically counts as a merely particular subject rather than a particular subject that participates in and knows unconditioned truth. And while self-critical, self-reflective questioning of one's philosophical commitments is required to keep known truth alive and defendable, doing so incessantly without accepting uh, truth's actual presence in thought is not unnatural, um, as in unnatural doubts, but it is uh, unspiritual. <laughs> uh, trying to um, uh, give it a different uh, meaning then. Uh, unnatural doubt or unnatural uh, error. This also entails that if philosophy wants to defend its own status as a description of unconditioned truth, it has to prove this status. Philosophy must show that its own categorical definition as unconditioned truth self-comprehension is part of philosophy. In other words, it must prove that it knows that it is unconditioned truth. To do so, philosophy has to contain a philosophy of philosophy. Philosophical statements are thus justified in virtue of their forming part of a philosophical system that is proven to be truth's self-comprehension. So and so far as Hegel's claims about logic, nature and Geist in the encyclopedia do manage to track the idea's unconditioned truth, they are justified in virtue of being part of philosophy, which in turn proves to itself to be self-comprehending truth. This also applies to the deduction of philosophy itself. The category of philosophy is defined as true because it is part of philosophy and thus part of truth's self-comprehension. In so far as its deduction is correct, it is established as unconditionally true and it is known that philosophy is unconditioned truth's self-comprehension. Comprehending Hegel's analyses in the encyclopedia as philosophical knowledge thus includes the knowledge that philosophy incorporates its own philosophically justified meta-philosophy. Uh, while this reasoning is uh, um, quite obviously circular, um, Hegel doesn't think that is a problem. He would argue that it represents the only kind of knowledge that lives up to the standard of unconditionality. And any linear thinking that uh, refers to an external ground of any sort uh, uh, would not be um, unconditional. Ultimately, only the concept in the form of Geist can justify itself philosophically and only the concept can know itself because the concept is unconditioned truth. The concept is thus the sole criterion for guaranteeing the unconditionality of knowledge and thus for itself. In other words, only the truth can comprehend and judge the truth. Um, finite thinkers can only um, uh, be justified in judging philosophical propositions if they actually do uh, speak not only with their own voice, but uh, with their own voice in unison with the voice uh, of truth. Thinking along with the concept's definition of philosophy, this means that the philosopher comprehends that the concept is the only possible criterion, object and subject of truth. And the thinker's comprehension is justified because it embodies the unconditioned concept that, in its form as Geist, comprehends itself. Accordingly, such meta-knowledge about philosophy is itself conceptual. 
It is true self-referential knowledge held by a knowing subject about a known object. The subject is active geist, the object are the idea's categorical forms. At the same time, subject and object are the same. Since geist is a form of the idea, both subject and object um, of knowledge are the idea. In line with the concept's overarching self-referential structure, the encyclopedia as a system of philosophical knowledge thus aims to form a virtuous circle that contains the definition of philosophy as an irreducible and differentiated aspect of its content. Um, almost finished. Uh, to Hegel, doing philosophy properly thus includes knowledge of what philosophy is, what it says, and how it says it. This philosophical thinker is expected, sorry, his philosophical thinker is expected to first be familiar with the concepts differentiated categorical determinations, second, know that they are of the concept and thus deductively connected by it, and uh, third, know that the uh, knowledge that this affords is unconditioned truth's uh, self comprehension. Hegel's philosopher ought to have philosophical knowledge that contains a philosophically proven philosophy of philosophy. Okay, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Sebastian. We will now open for a uh, Q&A. So uh, please raise your hand and I will start taking notes. Um, okay, so Ansgar Lissi is first. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Sebastian, for that nice presentation. Uh, I, have, I have two questions. The first is not a question, it's a worry. And uh, you, you are arguing against an individualist conception of philosophy where apparently the individual thinker seems to play a role. And you mentioned Spinoza, Kant and Schelling. I don't know Schelling very well, but I, I fear you might be making up a straw man here because the individual thinker is a contingent being. And I don't think many people before the age of postmodernity would have introduced a notion of contingency into philosophy. Neither Spinoza nor Kant do that. And they, they have that gold standard of Euclidean geometry here, uh, ethics and deduced in geometrical method. You know, we start with a couple of principles that are evident in and through themselves. And then you deduce everything below it by means of logic. And this is the gold standard for philosophy for, for many, many people right up until Hegel. Okay. because it comes with the highest degree of certainty. Everything mm -hmm. else is just involved with a lot of speculation, but this is what involves certainty. And you even in Kant, Kant does it in the metaphysical foundations of natural science, for example, which is as metaphysics still a part of philosophy. And clearly this is the way we do also mathematics. It's, and the individual thinker has no role in here at all. He may be the one who writes down the book, but n nobody would argue that this is the, what an individual comes up with, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> and my, my second point is, is a, an actual question. Um, what's a, what's a, I think you, you overestim underestimate the importance of the notion of a proof in your paper. What, what's a proof? What does it mean to prove something for Hegel? Yeah. All right, that's it. Thank okay. you. Um, okay, thank you very much. Yeah, um, I think a commentary is spot on. Um, but um, yeah, I think the problem is everybody, all philosophers, almost, I guess, um, including David Hume even, um, want philosophical knowledge to be somehow uh, necessary, maybe even more certain or necessary than, um, than uh, mathematical uh, truths, or at least more contentful. Right? Um, but then the question is, how does the individual subject, the thinking subject, which probably comes into place with um, Descartes and modernity a bit, maybe a bit earlier, right? I mean, you might, you might know better. Um, how does this uh, subject relate to the objectively true unconditioned uh, content of philosophy? And um, it, I thought with, um, uh, say, empiricism, for example, if, if Hume says empiricism is unconditionally true, but um, he cannot generate the, no generate the notion of unconditionally true knowledge out of his own system. He, he has no explanation how knowledge can be unconditionally true. And yet he implies that he knows that philosophy works in this way and this is how philosophy must work. I think this might have been kind of Kant worry, uh, Kant's worry with uh, Hume. So Kant insists now um, the philosophical categories that we use and the syllogisms 
they, they have to be universal, they have to be necessary and follow from each other. So the categorical framework he's using um, is, is necessary. But then comes, and this is, you know, it's not necessarily my opinion, but uh, strangely uh, differentiates the thinking subject, the phenomenon, ph phenom uh, phenom phenomenal uh, subject um, of, the, um, of the realm of time, space, causality, and so forth, from the unconditioned noumenal truth. Uh, so, and this, this is the problem. Fichte is like, if philosophy has to be unconditionally true, but unconditioned truth is by definition out of reach of the thinking philosopher, then um, what are we doing? I mean, this is what Spinozists would say against Kant. They're like, okay, you say we can't talk about unconditioned truth, which Spinozists would say they are doing when they describe God. And yet Kant claims that the philosophical claims that he makes are unconditionally true. He says they have always been true. Uh, for example, moral philosophy, people have just not been able to, to define the imperative, but it has always been true. Uh, they will always be true. I mean, he was famously reluctant to accept any modifications to his own system by Fichte and so forth. So, uh, yeah, um, and I think this was a problem for Fichte, for example, thought that the, the knowing finite subject that is the philosopher has to stand in some kind of identity relation to the unconditioned truth that philosophy seeks in order to be um, able to justify that it is actually unconditioned truth that the philosopher knows. Um, and I, I think Fichte still defines philosophy as a striving for truth rather than a knowledge of truth because Fichte also makes a strict differentiation between God as the perfect unity of subject object and thus perfect knowledge and the, um, the conscious philosopher of the world of appearance it can't quite bridge, I would say, or doesn't want to bridge the two because he thinks if he bridges those two, then he's gonna to revert to Spinozism. And then in the end, everything is God and philosophy is God's self-thinking. And then the, the finite philosopher doesn't have a self-determining um, role in this process. Um, and Hegel, um, I think Hegel, Hegel's attempt would be to try and, and uh, retain subjectivity in its free autonomous state at the same time showing how this subjectivity as appearance of truth can be connected on instant of truth without being determined uh, by this overarching truth that Hegel then calls Geist instead of God in Fichte's sense. So second question, proof, I would say, yeah. For Hegel, philosophical proof, I would say, is to show that a categorical determination, um, just like uh, Fichte demanded of Kant, where he said, oh, Kant uh, couldn't, uh, couldn't deduce the categories um, of, of that perception. He just found them in the forms of judgment empirically. And, and Fichte says we have to deduce, um, philosophically deduce the categories we think are true. And Fichte thinks this has to happen with reference to a strictly kind of synthetic a priori uh, kind of justification referring to the most simple philosophical principle with which for Kant would be the transcendental unity of perception, which for Fichte is the uh, dynamic between I and non-I. And so Fichte tries to start showing that every philosophically valid category somehow in the practical and theoretical philosophy uh, follows from the dynamic between I and non-I. So this, this, this um, this mutual determination of I and non-I creates categorical content. And I, I would say Hegel roughly follows the same uh, notion and he tries to, to, to identify this, this most um, uh, primitive logical principle, which he calls the concept. And then out of this concept uh, develops all categorical determinations. And so a proof of a category would consist in showing that somehow a category follows um, out, of, out of the dynamic of this concept. And so the whole encyclopedia is an attempt to connect, um, with reference to the logic of the concept, connect all the categories. And, and this, he thinks, is a philosophical proof. Um, yeah, but the fact that he can go wrong and due to his own admittance does go wrong in doing so, <laughs> um, you know, uh, some people would say uh, shows that the system cannot be closed or that a system is, 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 is mistaken in some way or that even his method is, is followable. So, so even if one accepts this notion of deduction, it does not necessarily mean that that um, truth is, is, is always preserved in this deduction process. Yeah, okay, thanks. Our next question comes from Professor Thompson. Yes, yeah, Sebastian, thank you for this. This is a wonderful talk. I agree with so much of it, so I, I really uh, I wanna praise it, but I also have a couple of questions. One's fairly minor, the other more, I think, um, significant maybe. Um, the minor one is along the way you said, I think, if I, if I misunderstood you, please correct me, that uh, when we talk about the concept as freedom or as free, that mm -hmm. means that can or it cannot do what it wants to do. And that sounds like vilcura to me rather than 
anything else. So uh -huh. I'm troubled by that description okay. of, of the concepts and the notion of freedom employed there, particularly in paragraph 572, where he says, necessity has to be understood as free, right? The concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's the first thing. The, yeah. the, the second point is, and I think this is more worrisome ultimately to me, and that is, you, you mentioned at one point that um, the system has to have an account of its own, uh, it has to have an account of the philosophical possibility of cognition, right? Possibility of, of philosophical cognition. Mm -hmm. And I think that's exactly right. And I think that's what the, the end of the encyclopedia is. But I think that's different than a justification of the standpoint of philosophical cognition. And the reason why I think that is because, as you alluded to, if, if, you, if you allow it simply to be a, uh, the final section to be simply an account of the condition of the possibility of its own accomplishment, Right. Mm -hmm. um, then it's viciously circular. You said it's virtuously. I think it's viciously circular right. at that point. Um, I think it has to be, and I think this is what Hegel is saying, um, it has to get, there has to be a justification for the standpoint of philosophical knowledge itself. I take that to be, and here I'll just be polemical right, about this, I take that to be what the phenomenology is supposed to be. I take that's what the resolve to think abstractly is supposed to be. I think that's what all that introductory material to the encyclopedia is grappling with this problem of how do we justify, you know, the, the standpoint of thought with respect to uh, the object? How do we how do we grapple with that problem? Because that's a that's a preliminary problem. He originally called this in the preface to the phenomenology the problem of the ladder, right? Yeah, and then yeah. he eventually said, well, you need to be able to throw the ladder away. Okay, fine, but mm -hmm. that is the justification problem, and I don't take him in 572 and following to be addressing that justification. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where I'm worried about the circularity being vicious at that point rather than virtuous. Okay. Thank okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, that, that's a very uh, um, instructive question. <laughs> I already learned something. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, the first one. Okay. Um, I think, yeah, freedom is supposed to be the unity of necessity and contingency. So, um, he, he does say in a linear reading, for example, let's say on a linear reading of the encyclopedia, uh, uh, logic turns into nature necessarily, um, and nature necessarily turns into Geist. And there's a sense of necessity that this has to be given how the concepts work. Um, but I think he would say, as he says in the first syllogism of philosophy, this means not to properly comprehend how the system hangs together and what motivates um, the architecture of the system, but to understand it. Then the second uh, syllogism of um, philosophy, where it's um, Geist that uh, uh, finds itself in uh, nature and logic, this would be reflecting how the system works. And then properly uh, comprehend, uh, comprehending how the system works means to understand or comprehend that these parts are in a relationship of freedom. I, 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 I agree, maybe this was the implicit point, that uh, God uh, could not have um, chosen not to um, create or, or to turn itself into nature or guys. Uh, the, the absolute um, has to do it because it is necessary, but it, the way it turns itself into nature and guys is not determined by the structure of necessity because that would be um, uh, presupposing a, a logic of essence kind of style differentiation of the parts that are then identified, but by, by freely turning itself into them, it shows that it has always already been them. So, so the abstract notion, let's say, of a God before creation, for Hegel, doesn't really make sense from the conceptual point of view, because to think a God or the absolute idea without nature and Geist or God without creation um, means one just has abstracted this, this kind of notion um, of God away from the unity with the other moments before already. So, so it's, it's not necessary in the sense it has to happen in the technical sense of necessity. It's also not contingent in the sense God could have chosen not to turn himself into, um, uh, into nature or Geist or could have chosen not to create, but it's in the very free, um, in the free um, essence, in the free being of the logical idea or of God uh, from a theological point of view to, um, to, to be or to turn itself into, but ultimately I would say to be, to always already be united with. Uh, uh, nature. So the, the freedom, freedom has this, um, this dimension that it is not necessary. It, the identity is not, um, the identity is not added on afterwards, but it's also not contingent in the sense that it could have not, it could not have happened. Um, and yet, so there's movement, but the movement follows uh, a logic that 
yeah, is, is, is the unity of contingency and necessity. That is its own logic and that is, is freedom. I think that's as, as good as I can describe it maybe. Um, the, the second question, um, maybe, one could, uh, maybe one could differentiate between internal uh, justification and external justification. So if you're outside of the system and you want to get into the system, then you need um, to get to the standpoint that allows you to be within the system. I, I think that the phenomenology doesn't really do that. I think in the, in the end of the phenomenology, absolute knowing is, um, I would say, Im at least implicitly, is Geist's self-knowing. So it is the truth that knows the truth. But Hegel says himself later, it is still for self-consciousness. It is still how truth is for us um, or in itself. It's not a truth that is in and for itself. So even at the end of the phenomenology, you're not in the system yet. And you, you yourself have to, I guess, you yourself have to think, okay, but at the end of phenomenology, I'm still outside of the system. In order to get into the system, I have to, as a thinker, self-identify with the truth self-thinking. But this, as you said, I mean, this is a free choice. You, you, you have to make this yourself. You cannot follow Hegel or you cannot follow any reductio ad absurdum um, into the system. It has to be your free choice to identify, to self-identify with the truth self-thinking. And, and think of yourself as the truth that is thinking itself. And this is not, um, this is not achieved or this is not properly taught by, by the phenomenology, I think, because even at the end, uh, it's uh, for self-consciousness. And so if you are already in the system though, there's still a need for comprehending what it is one is doing when one is thinking along with the truth. Um, I mean, from the perfect ideal point of view, you always already have all philosophical knowledge all at once. So the whole system is, is open to view to your mind. It is self-thinking truth. You are with self-thinking truth. So, so there's not even a linear way of thinking the system. It's, it's all present in a way conceptually all at once. So you, once you're in the system, you already know that philosophy is truth self-thinking because you know everything that, that's, that's happening in the system. But, but this self-knowledge that you are participating in, in truth self-thinking is still answering to a need for justification, for need um, for comprehension of what it is that you're doing. Um, so even within the system, there is a conceptual necessity for comprehending what it is one is doing. And this, I think, is what the, what the deduction of the category of philosophy is trying to catch for. Maybe it's misleading to call this justification, because justification um, might evoke in, in people that um, it is something uh, what has to be justified is something external to the thinker or one has to be outside of something to to be justified about something or to be able to enter into some kind of a spiritual relationship um, and in that sense or maybe or maybe one could say then it's the um, making possible of a certain kind of self transparency of a proper uh, of a proper understanding of what what it is that one is doing philosophy i mean relating to the theme of the conference one could say how, how does philosophy connect to being? Um, either you comprehend it and then all determinations are, are transparent anyway and you know everything that is happening in the system all at once. Or if you read it in a linear way, you can say, okay, now I know what philosophy is. I've come to the end of the system, but what is philosophy and what does philosophical knowledge consist in? And then you're thrown back automatically to, to, to being, to its most abstract determination, uh, just to again, render explicit to yourself what you already know. And um, so if this, is this making complete and motivating what you actually always already know if you're in the system. If this is justification, then yeah, I would say one could call it justification. If justification is something where something external to your mind or something that you don't know about has to be justified, maybe in, in Gettier examples and so forth, or empirical models of justification, then I would say, yeah, um, that's definitely not this kind of justification. Um, yeah. Thank you. Our next question comes from uh, Professor Schick. Okay, uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Sebastian, for this elucidating uh, talk. Um, I have an old uh, problem and I, uh, I'm happy to <laughs> put it <laughs> to you. Um, the, in describing, in characterizing the overarching structure of um, the whole, uh, um, you, and I think rightly so, uh, following Hegel, um, used expressions like self-comprehension, self-comprehension, the idea thinking itself, 
So, um, and all those expressions um, originally stem, obviously stem uh, from the sphere of subjective spirit. Mm -hmm. And this is one part of the uh, system. So um, what do we do uh, with, with that? Is, um, are we talking there, is it, um, are, are these um, symbols, is this an, an image for um, some uh, more conceptual um, structure? So, or, or is it um, meant to be taken liter literally self-comprehension, mm -hmm. thinking, and so on. That's my question. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I would say, I mean, in the third syllogism, uh, but I guess also in all syllogisms, Hegel describes Geist as, as an ontological principle, as a subject. So it says, is the idea as a subject? Um, and so uh, he seems to um, attribute to it certain qualities that maybe we as finite subjects have also. Um, and I think it's, it is this identity relationship that we share with this universal dimension of spirit ultimately that, um, that uh, make, for example, the having of um, emotions, intuitions, representations, and so forth, make, they, they are spirit um, because we are spirit and, and spirit uh, is us. Uh, so when we have intuitions, representations, feelings, and so forth, in a sense, it is spirit uh, having them uh, and, and vice versa. Because we have this, we have this um, concept-based identity relationship with spirit. Of course, in the definition of uh, philosophy, uh, especially in the successful definition of the third syllogism, Hegel assumes that this um, having of intuitions and representations and, and replacing these with proper concepts and thus proper categorical knowledge about what philosophy is, is successful. So there's no doubt, there's no error, um, there's no confusion, there are no uh, assumptions of, of any sort. So all the things that plague um, finite empirical kind of thinkers are by definition already uh, not part of this picture of, of, of philosophy. Uh, so, I mean, he does say we can intuit the truth, we can feel the truth, we can represent the truth, and we conceptualize the truth. And when we conceptualize the truth, we are doing philosophy successfully. And then we are, we are one with the spirit self-comprehension. Uh, but also spirit's self-comprehension is taking place through us and our free decisions and our finite acts of, of making the effort of, of thinking um, the proper content of philosophical categories. So, so this, it's kind of a, I mean, it is, it is the causality of, of freedom uh, that, that defines whether it is spirit or whether it is us who's doing the thinking or the self-determining. Um, so, or, everything that happens with spiritual beings ultimately is universal spirit doing it. But at the same time, everything that happens with universal spirit is us uh, doing it. So, um, yeah, um, it's, it's hard to look at. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a logical simultaneity, I would say. But as I said, I mean, that, that's exactly the problem. That's also, what's the definition of freedom? What is the concept? Uh, how, do, how do differentiated moments relate to each other? I mean, it, I think in, in the end, Hegel's answer is it is freedom. He tries to describe this, this kind of unity. Uh, with the concept in the most abstract way, but um, yeah, but that, that's all one, one can say, apart from analyzing its logical structure and repeating what he says about double self-negation and, and so forth. But yeah, but I, I, I agree, it's, it, that, that's the problem. <laughs> that's the problem. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Next question comes from uh, Xavier Aranda. Um, okay. I'm sorry, it seems. Okay. Hi. First, thank you for your great presentation. Um, the question I have, and I hope it doesn't go really off topic, is about the. Um, um, well, I'm, I'm from an analytic background, and I wanted to. Well, I think that there's a interesting lesson to be learned about the issue of the reflection of essence in, in relation to what Hegel is trying to do in the, in the science of logic. But I was thinking that in order to take um, or to be able to Im import some of those um, concepts that Hegel is trying to 
argue. Um, do you think that um, there's um, relevant, uh, well, I mean, how could we relate um, the logic between universals, particulars, and individuals to a more uh, current uh, analytic philosophy without trying to um, appear that we are still trying to defend a sort of syllogistic, uh, almost to, uh, I don't know, anachronistic way of thinking. Mm, yeah. Um, I think, for example, the, especially the problem between how do universals relate to particulars uh, or how, what is first, particular reality or universals or or even individuals and how they relate to particulars and so forth. I mean, those are problems discussed, I would say, in contemporary metaphysics. Um, the problem sometimes is that it seems to me that the method of thinking that is used in, in a lot of contemporary literature is what Hegel might call or Kant also understanding or Verstandesdenken or the thinking of reflection. So a lot of the, a lot of the categorical um, determinations or um, configurations that you find in the contemporary literature are somehow based on constellations of universal and particular and individual that can be placed within, let's say, the logic of being or the logic of essence. And what, what makes Hegel's solution to the problem uh, somewhat unappealing to a lot of thinkers, uh, contemporary ones also, is that he's relying on speculative uh, reasoning and, and his peculiar brand of speculative reasoning. I mean, he himself thought Plato and Aristotle were already doing speculative reasoning and, and um, maybe the difficulty in determining whether uh, Aristotle talks of one substance or of two substances or whether the first substance is particularity or the second substance is universality and how they relate or in my talk and how God's universality relates to the particular thinkers particularity and so forth. Um, so you could, you could go to the neo-Aristotelians that are writing now and say, okay, look, look even, even Aristotle was using speculation to some degree. He was, he was fuzzy or he was, he was not entirely clear. You can't, you can't Aristotle pin down precisely with regards to uh, clear cuts, categories of the understanding or reflection, what he actually thinks about the relationship between the particular and the universal. And so you can maybe open an argumentative route there and say, okay, not even Aristotle is very clear and this makes him maybe interesting, even better than those philosophers who are very clear because philosophers who are very clear, like Spinoza one could say, um, they then self undermine, right? If, if, they are, if they are so clear about what is first that they, that they do admit it's the universal. The universal is first, and in the end of the day, everything can be explained with regards to the universal. Then maybe the universal is self-undermining, right? Hegel's argument is you can't make sense of our universality without particularity on the same ontological plane, and so self-refuting. Or if you go to hardcore nominalists or, or particularists or even empiricists, um, and they say, no, in the end of the day, everything is a particular. I mean, anything that seems general or universal has to be explicable in, in uh, the last instance with reference to particulars, then you can show, okay, but what is particularity? If, if particularity is all there is, how, how can you even comprehend its determination without contrasting it always already to the universal? So that would be, for example, kind of a Hegelian uh, strategy, maybe yeah. just to go into the commitment of the contemporary literature, analyze uh, what the most fundamental notion of the relationship between universal and particular is, and then show why this internally uh, self-contradicts. Like there's, there's an imminent problem with it and they will always produce the same problems as long as they hold on to this kind of fundamental commitment. And this, I would say this is kind of Hegel's strategy in, in the logic anyway, uh, what he's trying to do with yeah. it. But, but I agree, I mean, eh, there are people, there are a lot of thinkers to whom you can repeat this logical structure of the concept for many years to come and you can always try to reformulate it and find new ways of explaining it but they will not accept it because they expect, for them an explanation means to get an argument in terms of understanding or reflection. So in terms of being or essence, and there's something in them that, that makes them not like speculative um, simultaneity or the simultaneity of identity and difference, something they dislike about it. Um, that's why like, for example, they will try to, to, to pin Aristotle down or to pin Plato down on either it's the universe is first or like this either or thinking like they feel like unless they are clear about what is first they they don't um they haven't understood it they haven't conceptualized it or it's, it's yeah. not a successful argument in a way so i think in, in the end of the day there is a it's, it's not a taste i would say i mean fichte would say it's a question of character or taste what kind of philosophy you prefer i would say it has to be reason that ultimately guides you to the right kind of way of thinking um 
And if Hegel is, is right, then it has to be reason itself. And every reasonable person so far as they are reasonable somehow have to arrive at the notion that logic of essence and logic of being and therefore reflection understanding cannot really uh, describe truth. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, I guess that's, that, that's, that itself is up to, up to debate. But, but there's a methodological thing going on in the background. I think that that's worth maybe making more explicit. So, so one doesn't always run into the same problems on the, on the first level of, um, okay, I'm committed to the understanding, so I will reject everything that is reduced, uh, that, that goes beyond understanding. Well, I'm, I'm committed to the method of reflection, and so everything that goes beyond that, I will refuse to accept. Um, maybe if one problematizes this difference between understanding reflection and speculation, maybe then one can maybe open the minds a bit or more or be more appealing mm -hmm. or something. <laughs> okay, thank <laughs> you very much. <laughs> thank you. Next question comes from Ahilius. Hi, thank you very much for your talk, Sebastian. Uh, I have a question regarding what you said towards the end of your talk, where you were talking about the uh, the importance for deducing the concept of philosophy for knowing that the that everything that we've, that we've done up until this point is true. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if, I, if I misunderstood what you're saying, please tell me. But one, one concern that I have when I, I hear this is something along the lines of, doesn't this then render all the so-called necessary developments that we've been doing so far, um, uh, doesn't it render them open to skepticism? And if it, if it does, then why doesn't it also render open to skepticism the final deduction of philosophy, since it's following the exact same thing that we've done from the very beginning. Okay. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, maybe it's it's related to Professor Thompson's question. And um, I would say, in a way, I was misrepresenting Hegel's account of uh, what what happens because. I think it, he, he would argue if you think philosophically in the, in the most profound sense, then you, you have the whole system in view, and then you don't need yet another justification for um, what you have been doing all along, because you always already know what it is that you're doing. You know this is the thinking of truth. But um, there, there is also at the same time this uh, perspective of the finite thinker, um, there's something, he says there's something about uh, truth, about philosophical truth that demands uh, justification from us as if we were arguing with somebody, as if somebody was uh, questioning us, as if somebody was, was rendering a uh, 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 skeptical doubt at us. And this, I think, uh, points to his notion that you have to, as Professor um, uh, Trisokas, for example, argued, um, we mentioned before, before the talk, um, he thinks this voice, um, which is not obviously the voice of a single person, but this voice of negation, this voice of challenge is part of truth itself, as it is part of the concept where the universal negates itself and so challenges itself in a way or skeptically uh, questions itself to turn itself apart together and so forth. So, so to, to appease or to, to, to do justice to this concept internal doubt, you have to show as a philosopher, uh, when arguing with other philosophers, that you are following the concept by utilizing or by properly tracking this kind of concept uh, internal doubt. And so, I mean, I said, how do we know that we philosophically know? How can we, um, how can we appease this philosophical doubt that we have? How do we know that we're really thinking with the truth rather than just bringing in our own prejudices or making mistakes? And I mean, Hegel himself changed his system, I would say, until his last breath probably, and you know, he was constantly rearranging things and so forth. So even Hegel thought, you know, this wasn't ironclad and necessary and so forth. And I would say, Hegel, in the end of the day, he says, it's only by making an argument that follows from the logical structure of what truth is, which, which he thinks is the unconditioned concept. And his proof of that itself, right, um, is obviously open to, to, to skeptical doubt. I mean, you can, you can always doubt any kind of the transitions in the system. But Hegel would say, what, this, what the philosopher has a right to demand is that you prove that your doubt is reasonable. So you can't just uh, negate any kind of thing. You can't negate the transitions without further reason. You can't, you can't just say, no, I don't believe it. Or this is wrong. You know, like maybe, maybe like Charles Taylor does when he says, I don't understand how becoming turns into Dasein. This doesn't make sense, right? But, that, but that's not an argument, right? As a philosopher uh, who provides a system, who deduces a notion of truth, 
um, you have the right, therefore, to at least demand reasonable arguments against uh, what you're doing. And um, yeah, um, so um, barring reasonable arguments, he could at least find himself from his contemporaries or, or in the past or whatever he could think of. Um, Hegel came to these deductions in the system. Uh, at some point, I think he says, I know this is true, even if I can't prove it at all times, but I, I, I know uh, the truth when I see it. You know, but there is this problem that the finite philosopher can always err, and the finite um, historically situated thinker can always err. But um, yeah, but, but then you, you yourself have to prove that, you're, uh, that, that there is error, that your doubt is, is justified. And so if you do this consistently and as, as well as you can as a philosopher uh, and so forth, then you, you come up with a philosophical system where in the end of the day, there is a question, there's a skeptical doubt or there's a, there's a kind of integrated negativity into your thought process that does ask you, but what it is, uh, what, what is it that I have been doing? What is it that I've been doing along with the truth? Uh, if you already conceive of yourself as knowing that philosophy is, is following the truth, uh, what is it that, let's say, philosophy uh, does to us with regards to the truth that um, arts and religion do not? How, how, how is it that these categorical determinations did follow out of this kind of reasoning, out of the concept? How is it that they are connected in the way that I have uh, been um, uh, able and have been trying to? to connect them by, by following the logic of the concept. And I think this, this is the answer that the, uh, philosophy, that the definition of philosophy then gives. It's just kind of a, in a way, in a way as I said, you can, be, you can be right about the intellectual intuitions that you have, but if you have not proven them, then you're not doing philosophy in the most meaningful sense. Uh, then, you're, then you're kind of a dogmatist. You could say, like Spinoza, he has this great intellectual intuition that in the end of the day, everything is universal, everything is God, and that's it. That, that's his major intuition. And then he has other intellectual intuitions about how the Modi relate to this and so forth. But Hegel would say, there is a lot of truth already in Spinoza. I mean, it's like almost, almost the highest form of, of logic of essence, for example, the most concrete notion of truth. But um, that's not enough. As a philosopher, you have, to, you have to prove, you have to show that your intellectual intuition is correct. And, and this, you can only do with a method that actually uses the truth itself to show that its own deductions are correct and that this is what the truth is doing and that this is what philosophy is overall and this is how philosophy has to work. I think that is only truly self-transparent in the way um, Hegel demands um, about all the moments of the concept and the philosophy uh, with the definition of philosophy in the end. It's only when it's, it's spelled out and proven with the right method um, when the, when the right intellectual intuition is proven with the right method, uh, then it is proven that it is true. And since philosophy is this very act of proving, unless you have proven what philosophy is, you haven't properly um, comprehended or you haven't properly done uh, philosophy in, in a completely uh, as self-referential and, and completely um, successful way. I mean, Spinoza has a, has a, Spinoza already has a notion that philosophy is, God loving itself or God um, in a way, God referring to itself, not thinking because he thinks God doesn't think, but um, so the notion is already, already Spinoza had this intellectual intuition or already Aristotle had this intuition that philosophy is, is universality, is self-thinking. Um, but he would say it's not good enough just to have the intuition, uh, although it is a large part of the truth is having the right intuitions, but you, you have to have the method and you have to prove with the method that this is philosophy, um, this is what philosophy is in order to properly um, make intelligible to yourself, but also to your critics, to your skeptics, to other philosophers and so forth, that, that, that philosophy is self-known truth. Okay, thank you very much. Our next question comes from Professor Trisokas. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Sebastian, for, for, for the talk. Um, I think it's, it's a very good idea, a very good project this one of um, um, finding a justification for philosophy. Um, not many people have worked on this, I think. So yeah, uh, I appreciate it that you're uh, doing it. Um, so just two small, small, small points. Uh, the one is, uh, what are your thoughts about this notion of letting go that is, um, is dominant both in the phenomenology and the logic. Uh, so that, how, how does this square with this idea of freedom 
you know, if, he, if the only thing we need to do is just let go and just follow uh, thought or the movement of consciousness in the phenomenology. Yeah. Um, okay, and, but the second point is just, that goes to the very first question, which I thought was really a very good question. Uh, what, I mean, can you say exactly, I mean, what is this freedom of the finite philosophy? Is, is it just the decision to enter? Is that, is that the content of freedom? Is there anything else? Because if you enter the system, it will lead you to the very end of it, and you will acquire the content that the system uh, gives you. So I don't understand, you know, what else? What else is included in this freedom of the finite thinker? Mm -hmm. And the, the very last point I want to make is, you know, about the, the notion of justification and that we are searching for justification uh, in the system. But there's also the notion of reason itself, which is the case in Kant, uh, that reason itself seeks for justification. Why is that not enough? So why, why does this not explain the very um, idea of justification in the system? Why do we need to include the finite thinker mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in this process of justification? Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, very um, uh, uh, difficult question. <laughs> um, uh, I would say, okay, I think letting go, in a way, letting go is enough and in a way it's not. So letting go is an act you have to work very hard and think very hard and, and engage with your representations and imbue them with thought and, and try to make thoughts, negativity work on your representations in order to let go and think along with conceptual truth. So, so it's kind of letting go and making an effort at the same time. You make the effort of getting rid of your prejudices, of, of thinking about the representations that you have, your assumptions, your feelings, your your potentially erroneous um, uh, conceptual contents um, in whatever form they come. So, so this is obviously an act. You have to want to, to think about your representations, your intuitions, your feelings even, and so forth. Um, but then at the same time, um, when you identify what is wrong about them, what is erroneous, what is, what is unjustified doubt, or what is, uh, what is not true about your representations, about your feelings and intuitions, then you have to let go of them in order to be able to think along uh, with the true concept, with the true concept that, that ultimately is always already there, that is always already in your mind. So the truth is, is there always already. It, it comes in all kinds of forms. I mean, feeling, intuition, representation, and so forth. But it is, it is, it is unclear. It's kind of, um, it is um, distorted. It's impure. And, and so the philosopher has to, make the great effort to, to cleanse uh, one's own thinking of, of everything that's not, uh, that's not in tune with the concept. And, and, and this involves the one dimension is, is letting go of what is false in your mind, that, that's in your mind right now. I mean, there's always falsity of some sense, there's always error in some way. Um, but yeah, but it's, it's not just letting go, I totally agree. Uh, it's not just, um, whew, I just give myself over to thought and because I mean, we are subjects, according to Hegel, right? We are individual, um, Kant-style, autonomous subjects. We are struggling with the objectivity of our own minds, with the objectivity of the world, with doubt and error, with external obstacles all the time. They keep us from philosophizing, or um, he makes you know, a reference to these um, needs of civil society that keep him from thinking and so forth. I mean, they are real, and the struggle is real. Um, it's that there's no kind of perfectly, I would say, there's no perfect heavenly kind of bliss um, where, where um, you're one with the truth in the Spinoza sense that there's nothing left of you. Like there's no, like you're not a, I would say you're not a Sufi, uh, according to Spino, according to Hegel, where, where your particularity and therefore also the sense of difference uh, totally and utterly uh, kind of disappears. Um, um, but, uh, but letting go means to allow the universe, allow, to allow thought to enter your mind and, and determine it and then go along with it. Um, yeah, second one. Yeah, I think... Um, Following the system, strictly speaking, would not be philosophy in the sense that, okay, we're just reading what Hegel is doing and we try to understand what he has said, uh, said to us. That's not philosophy, according to Hegel, I would say. Um, that's just dogmatic, philological kind of regurgitation of what somebody has thought before you, if, if this is all that you're doing. 
if you are uh, thinking with Hegel and with the system, and at the same time, uh, think for yourself and, and use reason as such to um, show to you what is true about your thought and what is true about Hegel's thought also, and what is false about it, then you're doing philosophy. So, so you use Hegel as a, as a means of inspiration, and it might well be that there's a lot, a lot of truth in there that you also then come to, maybe in your own words, maybe with other representations and so forth in a different way, but, but it, it will still be the same truth. And then, and then you, you can say with your own words and with your own thoughts that, that what you find in Hegel is true, and then you can give reasons and you can give a, a, a maybe concept-based argument for it, right? If, if, concept, if the concept is a form of reason. But if, yeah, but I agree if you, if you just follow the necessity of the transitions of thought and so forth in this kind of um, philological kind of manner, then that would not be philosophy. And, and so the freedom uh, comes in, in your constant uh, will and self-determination to, to think the truth and not to think Hegel. You have to always want to think the truth and, and not, not just Hegel. Um, and it, it requires an act of self-determination and resisting this urge just to think along with Hegel. Um, and, and maybe this is a form of freedom that you have to constantly employ, not to just give yourself over and lose yourself and just kind of following the, the system. So, so maybe that's a space for freedom. And the third one, uh, I think we, we do need the thinker um, in a way, because if we didn't have the thinker, then we might be spinocists or we might be, let's say, relativists that think, okay, no, I mean, we would be probably spinocists because if, if the thinker is not real, then particularity is not real in the process of philosophical thoughts. And then in the end of the day, it would just, everything would just be truth. Or maybe, you know, Parmenides maybe, but I guess Spinoza already uh, is modern in the sense that um, truth is always relational. Although in the end of the day, all there is is substance, uh, there have to be modi in some way relating to the sub. So he's not Parmenides where everything is just being and you know, uh, there's, there's no uh, determination in the end of the day. Um, but yeah, but I would say that's a problem. So we, we need the thinker because we need particularity in order to even determine the universality that, it, that we are trying to think uh, philosophically. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your questions, they were very uh, helpful. All right. Uh... So Sebastian, how are you doing? We have a few more questions. Oh yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> I've but if, if you... quite a lot, but I don't know about how the audience is doing, listening to my voice for so long. <laughs> are you able to do uh, two or three more questions? Yeah, 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 I'm fine. Maybe I just have a zip of water, but I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> All right, he's he's gonna power on. Okay, so I'm I have a few questions of my own, and um, one is a little bit more polemic than the other one. So I'll start with the polemic one. So you said at some point that a philosophy aspires for completeness. So does that mean we cannot have a genuine philosophy that doesn't aspire to do this? So we can't really have particular uh, uh, philosophies without suffering them being one-sided. Mm -hmm. So what does this mean for you know philosophies of, for example, film, feminism, nature, morality, science, and so on, right? Mm -hmm. But maybe we could think of it from the, another perspective, right? Maybe seen from uh, systematic philosophy, these particular particular philosophies, by just going into particularity, indirectly enrich you know the wholeness of philosophy. Mm -hmm. yeah. So maybe there, maybe that's uh, you know another another way to look at it. So that, that's one question, and the other question is: I'm just going to jump on the bandwagon of this whole uh, you know skepticism and proof issue, mm -hmm. and so in your in your syllogism right the the first premise is is about uh, philosophy being unconditionally true and known to be so right mm -hmm. so you know um we don't start out with that uh we have to sort of get to that stage and um and we and we don't start in a i mean you've you've g given lots of um descriptions about this but it seems to me that uh, we, we have to start from the linear and we have to take the external proof making and see where that can take us. And that has to undermine on its own before we can then, you know, sh uh, see that there is some sort of uh, other negative unity going on. But then does that mean, you know, once we get to the end, once we understand that, yes, philosophy is what is unconditionally true and known to be so, 
that then we must throw away the ladder, like external proof making is, has to be like uh, excluded in, in this. So I'm just wondering at, uh, towards the end, like if, if the, the, um, there isn't something lost in the development, if we have to take this away, or if, if indeed it is that the case that we must take it away in order to get to the, to the full sort of um, unconditionality that we were aiming for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, and, and like you did at some point uh, talk about like a different sense of justification. Mm -hmm. So if that is a different sense of justification and proof making going on, could, would you have any idea of what we could call that to just distinguish so that you avoid confusion? So on. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, yeah, very much. Um, yeah, um, I, I would say about different kinds of philosophy. So um, if philosophy really is forming representations and then finding what is conceptual in representations, um, or if philosophy is having intellectual intuitions, but then also showing that they follow from each other or relate to each other with a certain kind of method, then all philosophies are valuable. Um, even the ones that produce almost no conceptual content whatsoever, because then they warn you about um, uh, arguments to avoid, right? So I think if you're a philosopher nowadays and you read uh, contemporary philosophy, um, you can find by thinking through the arguments and the presuppositions and the constellations that, that these arguments and syllogisms and intuitions articulated in the philosophy uh, that, that, that are implied there, you think through these and then you find intellectual intuitions, you find categorical shapes um, determining being in the background of these kind of different kind of philosophies. And then by thinking further, you, you then come to a notion of mm, that's a legitimate shape or this shape is already contained in this one or this is, this is generally new. And so I have to be able to account for this kind of categorical shape somehow. What does accounting for mean? Okay, it means to connect it with other categorical shapes I already have. Let's say you, you're building your own system and you know, a philosophy of nature, let's say. Um, natural science creates a lot more new categories that for example, Hegel didn't have in view. Um, maybe quantum or super string or super, super symmetry or, yeah, um, yeah. And um, by thinking through them, through these representations mostly that natural sciences uses, you find that these representations do carry the concept or some kind of conceptual uh, category uh, truth in them. And then as a philosopher, you, you capture that with your mind and, um, and then by connecting it to the shapes that are already known and are already deduced by you or by, uh, by Hegel and then you improve that deduction or you, you, you go along with it because you have discovered it to be true or whatever, then you can um, thereby enlarge and increase and render more substantial and more detailed and maybe more convincing and more rich uh, the philosophical system that is the one truth, right? If, and this is all if Hegel's method is, is correct, right? And then maybe that's, that relates to your second question where it might just be that Hegel's notion of philosophy is just, is just false, right? I mean, you can, you can reject the whole notion of systematic philosophy. You can reject the notion of conceptual argument. You can reject the notion that we have to freely out of, your, out of our own volition enter the system that in a sense we always already are in, right? If Hegel is, is right, then the truth that he describes in the system is already all around us, in us, uh, everywhere, right? So, so it's not so much, um, Am I entering the system? Am I willingly entering the system? But am I willing to discover the truth that we all always already participate in? And my mind and the world, the natural world, the logic and so forth. So, um, yeah, I mean, as Professor Thompson said, I mean, there, can you argue somebody into philosophical thought, right? Can you, can you argue? And so I would say, Hegel tried with the phenomenology in a, in a sense, right? I mean, one could also say that's his first attempt at a system and it didn't quite work uh, entirely. And then, you know, he, he got restarted the whole system and so forth, but he took a lot of conceptual contents from the phenomenology into the system and almost most of the forms of consciousness, he rearranged um, how the categories related to each other and, and so forth, but, but um, a lot of it made it into it. And so this makes me think that already in the phenomenology, Hegel was doing what he was doing in the encyclopedia, which is trying to define the categorical shapes of unconditioned truth. It's just that he was so committed to the kind of Fichtean, kind of early Schellingian, uh, Schellingian uh, viewpoint of thinking of unconditioned truth as it is for finite consciousness, which is exactly the point of view of, of Fichte. Um, 
that he didn't want to let that go. I think he, he, he didn't want to let go of saying the phenology is truth for self-consciousness or for consciousness, because then he, maybe he had these worries, then he is a dogmatist, then he turns into Spinoza, then he says, this is God's self-thinking and that's it, right? There's no more room for, there's no more room for self-consciousness based doubt. And he wants to retain this because otherwise he thought maybe early, early Hegel thought then philosophy turns dogmatic. But I think later Hegel then thought, no, even within the system, there's still, uh, thought is still alive. There's still uh, the possibility for self-conscious thought based criticism of the system, of the transitions and so forth. Um, it's not um, the, the finite thinker, the finite philosopher with his or her self-determined um, desire to think freely um, never disappears, even in, in, the, in the perfect system, um, because the truth is alive and has to be alive, has to be thought by a self-conscious thinker in order to be truth at all. And then this means constant challenging of everything that has come before, constant challenging of Hegel's system, of his categories, enriching whatever one knows about truth by taking in new categories in every kind of context and, and, and so forth. Um, yeah, but yeah, I mean, is it an argument to ask somebody just, you know, just let go of your prejudice? <laughs> I mean, you first have to have a notion, what is a prejudice? Uh, what is it I'm supposed to let go of? How can I let go of that? Um, it's, it's like in Zen Buddhism where they say, okay, you want to be enlightened? Just enlighten yourself. Just, just be enlightened. That, that's all they say. I think in a similar way, that's all Hegel can say to somebody who wants to think philosophically. And how can I think philosophically? Well, do it, right? In a way, you're always already doing it because in all the intuitions and representations that you have, there is the concept, the same concept that determines all the truth and all the shapes and the word in your mind is always already at work in you. It's just that you have to realize this and, and uh, let, it, let it go and go along with it or consciously decide to go along with it. And then, and then it kind of happens. And when you read it in other people's work, then you will find, oh, okay, different words, but exactly the same category concept I was thinking. So, you, you, you find this identity everywhere in, 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 in the world, in science, in thinking, and the way you exchange with different cultures. I mean, we have these Hegel conferences now, and people from all, all, all corners of the world somehow with very different um, representations kind of are able to at least communicate on some level about these concepts that are always already there. So, yeah, I think, but yeah, but that, that's his ultimate argument if one wants to call it that way. So, justification in terms of it has to be. There have to be, yeah, as I said to Professor Thompson, one has to differentiate between two kinds of justification, maybe, um, or come up with a different term. Uh, the justification that makes you accept something that is, by definition, different from you. Justification that makes you believe on accounts that you did not think before. Something that somehow is external to your mind or a set of propositions. And a kind of justification that just explicates or just renders transparent what is always already there, what you, what you already know. Uh, it just it just tells you that you already know, or it shows you how you always already know. And may, yeah, maybe that's maybe that's not really justification <laughs> on on a certain definition. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's uh, I think that's that's a very <laughs> valid point. <laughs> Thanks, Sebastian. That's a really great response. It makes me think of like maybe the appearance of philosophy is not as you know fully fledged unconditional truth and known to be so, but really just skepticism, right? things that things don't seem to hang together and that prompts and provokes us to, to think about it. Yeah. But the concept, as you say, is sort of in the categorical structure is at work there. So thank you very much. Um, Mert is next. And then Georg and then we'll be, we'll be, done, uh, we'll be done. So thank you thanks. all for, uh, yeah. Well, thanks Sebastian for the interesting talk really. Um, and I found your reading quite striking to be honest, but I have only one worry. Uh, I don't know if you agree, but like, um, so like you pause Hegel like in relation to Aristotle and Spinoza, and 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 your framework was basically the concept, right? Because I mean, for instance, Spinoza wouldn't or Spinoza's universality would just kind of overwhelm the particularity, and there was a kind of problem in that, and so on and so forth. So in that regard, definitely, I think Hegel is right. But another remarkable point Hegel provides, I think, with his philosophy is basically the kind of foundational free philosophical system, right? Or kind of self-justificatory system. It doesn't need a foundation and so on and so forth. And what I find in your reading of the system and particularly the logic is basically kind of um, placing concept as the kind of foundation of the system. Because at some point you said that 
concept is the only criterion for the truth or for the philosophers to engage with, 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 with the source and so on and so forth. So I don't know if you agree with the non-foundationalist reading of Hegel, but it seems that if if you are bored with that idea, so what would be your answer actually if someone asks you, but you are doing something foundationalist over there? Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, um, I think uh, Richard in Winfield and Gregory Moss and so forth, I mean, they, they, they champion this notion of, of non-foundational, non uh, inter interfoundational thinking. And um, I think uh, in the spirit, uh, I agree with them, right? I mean, so, so if foundation means there's something presupposed that's different from the truth, or there's something one has to refer to that is by definition outside of the truth or, or um, is something outside of thought, then, then Hegel would, would reject this. Um, I would be so so in a way uh, it's foundational yes but it's self uh, founding right so uh, it's 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 there's a foundation because the the concept is internally differentiated into particularity universality and individuality so there's otherness but the otherness is not external to the truth like it is with essentialist foundationalist thinking where you have a condition and then the condition is fulfilled and then something um, is achieved and so forth so so yes, in a way that there are foundations, but the foundations are always already within, within the truth. So in that sense, I would say it's also, yeah, it's a, it could be misleading to say a non-foundationalist thought. I would say it's better to say self-founding thought or self-grounding thought, because for example, in the logic of being, there's no external foundation to being, there's no external foundation to Dasein, there's no external foundation to quality. They, they don't have this relational structure of the logic of essence where there's a condition or there's a ground, and then I refer to this in, the, in my process of justification. It's just there, being, Dasein, becoming. They don't, they don't refer to anything else, and yet they are deficient forms, uh, yet they, they are, they're not consistent. So if you say um, the truth is non-foundational, then your reader could think the truth is logic of being, because there are no foundations, there are no external foundations that I've referred to, with the categories of being. So in that sense, you know, if you want to be like uh, kind of nitpicky, then you could say uh, it's, not, it's not precise enough. And it's kind of a, I, I also thought it's a bit of a negative definition of truth because it's non-foundational. I mean, a lot of things are non-foundational, like mm -hmm. every logical structure that doesn't say there's a foundation or condition and I'm justified by it is non-foundational, right? So the <laughs> truth just on this definition could be anything, right? Um, that's, that just doesn't do this foundational thing. So. So, yeah, I thought maybe, you know, self-grounding truth or self-justifying or self-positing, those are all technical terms. Hegel thinks they are equivalent with what the logic is doing, what, what, uh, what freedom is. Um, but then, of course, you have to spell it out a lot more. And you have to explain the technical meaning you associate with it. But, but yeah, I, I, I would agree um, uh, yeah, that, that there is foundation, but it is a self-foundation. It's a self-grounding, self-founding kind of uh, movement. And maybe a positive definition is a bit more <laughs> determinate in a way than saying it's not X because then it could be A, B, C, D and so forth. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but yeah, I agree this. The foundations don't disappear, they're, they're not gone. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. All right, final question uh, goes to Georg Oswald. Um, yeah, thanks very much, Sebastian. I think you answered many uh, of my questions. So. I'm basically left only with a, uh, some kind of a provocative question. <laughs> so um, I would, um, <laughs> if, you, if you look at the, like at the whole system, I'm curious to, to find out what you think um, about the question whether uh, Hegel um, is uh, or remains uh, or is a dualist um, with regard to uh, knowledge uh, after all. And uh, the background of my question is um, one distinction that you uh, mentioned in uh, your talk, this distinction between unconditional and uh, conditional truth. So um, of course you can say that um, uh, conditional, uh, um, uh, that uh, unconditional truth is conditional in the sense that um, uh, it uh, follows some certain rules that is uh, that it is contained within unconditional knowledge so you have uh, for unconditional uh, knowledge you have to play a game you have to um, uh, be, uh, set a beginning 
um, with, uh, for instance, uh, with minimal standards, then you can like derive uh, conceptual frameworks so on so, uh, so forth. And this uh, conceptual framework is the condition of the unconditional. So, uh, but uh, on the other hand, um, you have, of course, um, maybe um, uh, conditional truth and conditional knowledge in a uh, more mundane uh, uh, way, uh, namely uh, a knowledge that is um, an appropriation to some kind of an external object. And um, this uh, kind of truth and knowledge does not necessarily have to play by uh, the rules of unconditional knowledge. So, so basically we are left with certain kind of truth, uh, conceptions of truth, and um, so I'm basically it's an open question for me, but um, uh, would you would you say that Hegel tried to give an account of like of a strong kind of uh, knowledge? If so, um, how would you um, what would your argument be for um, some kind of um, uh, rules that would allow to uh, transfer conditional knowledge in the in the second uh, form uh, that I mentioned to uh, the uh, conditional truth in the first uh, form that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. do, do you get the idea of my question? Is is it clear? I think um, I tried I tried to answer what what I thought I understood and and maybe you can uh, yeah sure. Um, yeah, um, is the framework the condition of the unconditional knowledge? So do we have to spell out a philosophical system um, and only then can achieve unconditional knowledge or unconditional philosophical knowledge? Is, is this um, a notion or? No, well, uh, the, the conditional knowledge that is contained within the unconditional knowledge is yeah. basically the following, uh, uh, the following the rules of the unconditional knowledge. So mm -hmm. um, basically what, I mean, the, the, the usual, the proper example would be uh, what, for instance, Dieter Hendrich, uh, Koch, Martin, so on and so forth, famously um, uh, spelled out um, um, uh, uh, with, with the notion of a determinate negation, right? So you have the speculative Satz, for instance, uh, this is some kind of self-determining process mm -hmm. and the spelling out of this process like with, uh, reading with Koch, the evolution of logical space mm -hmm. uh, provides some kind of criteria that are uh, in a way, um, uh, you know, moments of, of the unconditional and therefore you can call them some kind of conditions for the unconditional, mm -hmm. for the understanding of the conditional. But this is only the first, the first meaning. So, and then there, you, uh, you have like a stricter meaning of the um, uh, conditional uh, truth that does not play by these kind of rules, um, like for instance, scientific knowledge. Um, okay, I see, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, yeah, I will agree, yeah. So philosophical knowledge and its method are different from the sure. method, yeah, and cognition, yeah. obviously. But, yeah, yeah. but both are uh, types of knowledge. Yeah, both are types of knowledge. So philosophical knowledge uh, is knowledge by the um, unconditioned of the unconditioned. So it's purely self-referential and all differentiation and all particularity is is within is all from the beginning onwards is always already within. So it's, it's always unconditioned reason as yeah. subject, knowing unconditioned is also. And cognition, I would say, um, in a way, yes. Uh, in a way, cognition is a deficient form of philosophical knowledge, because when you cognize natural science, um, all the social sciences, all the humanities, and so forth, they assume their object of inquiry to be objective and therefore to differ from them as subjects. And so all empirical knowledge uh, is doing and cognition is doing is taking the unconditioned, but in the form of objectivity and translates it into subjective states of mind or propositions. Um, and so it's kind of, they're kind of distorting uh, what philosophical knowledge is, but it's a necessary distortion. It's, it's one of the ways that spirit has to um, uh, acquire knowledge, has to uh, work itself uh, um, against the environment in order to form representations to then um, find the concept that is at work within those representations. So in truth, um, cognition is already a part of philosophy. It's kind of um, the forming of representations that are then replaced by concepts um, uh, through philosophy and the content, in a sense, the content is the same. The content is always the truth. It's just that cognition and sciences and so forth, 
they assume um, their object and the truth that they're seeking to be objective and therefore to differ from themselves. Um, but because um, all of science, the scientific community, all spiritual beings engaging in, in cognition and therefore in science are part of um, unconditional truth, uh, geist as such, uh, getting to know itself, um, in, in a sense, they, they can be, I would say, be called a, a, a deficient form of philosophical knowledge um, or a, different, a deficient form of knowledge. Uh, it's not philosophical knowledge, but it's, it's cognition-based knowledge. Um, but it is a necessary, it's a necessary moment uh, of the self-realization of philosophical knowledge. Um, and so far, it's, it's, it's not deficient um, in its own right. When you take it as what it is and what it is striving for, um, then, then it, it would not be just deficient. It's just a kind of a necessary moment of the unconditioned to that, that is seeking to know itself. Um, well, yes. Yeah, well, can I can I um, yeah. like interrupt? Um, very shortly, else? Georg. Very, okay. very, yeah. Because I mean that that's rather a strong claim, isn't it? I mean, if you say, for for instance, to some kind of a, 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 to to the to the medicine. Well, um, uh, your uh, your knowledge is only a deficient mode or philosophical mode. Um, that would sound very weird because what what you're trying to say uh, sounds for me either trivially true or false. It is trivial true in the sense that philosophical terms are so broad. Of course, they do apply to finite knowledge, but um, that doesn't explain really the truth of finite knowledge because there is so much uh, in it contained that belongs uh, to this kind of knowledge. So saying, well, what sociology does, so on and so forth, is a deficient mode of philosophy. Well, you can say that at the Hegel, Hegel cult, uh, if you're in the Hegel cult, but like in the, in the <laughs> real world, that, that there would be like a really strange thing to say that yeah. your mode of knowledge is only a deficient mode of philosophy. Yeah. That's, that, that's, that's only what, what I want to say, like from a common sense perspective. Uh, yeah. what, what you're saying sounds, sounds really harsh, you know? Okay, yeah. No, that, that's why I, I did qualify and say in its own right. Uh, you know, it is, it is knowledge. It is truth. It, is, it has a proper standing. It's just um, a way of, of showing unconditional uh, truth in the form of representations. And those representations are based on the assumption that the truth is, is an objective uh, uh, given, is an objective world. Of course, the pragmatic goals of the particular sciences, um, they are valid in their own right, right? They're not trying to do philosophy. So you, in, a, in a sense, it's unfair to say, oh, you're failing at doing philosophy because they're not even trying. But, but if you say there's a hierarchy of knowledge, you know, like Plato did already, you know, with like mathematics just uh, below philosophy and then empirical knowledge and sensors knowledge and so forth underneath. Um, yeah, if you take the absolute standpoint of the highest possible knowledge is philosophical knowledge, and then all other forms of knowledge, including mathematics and, and, and just intuitions and feelings and so forth, but also all the sciences, from that perspective, uh, they are deficient. But as I said, I mean, they are necessary. Uh, they're necessarily existing uh, deficient modes of knowledge creation and representation creation and problem solving, of course, but that's, that's not the Empirical problem solving is not the domain of philosophy, <laughs> but then, of course, if you take their standpoint, you can say all of philosophy is just um, is just uh, pointless attempts of solving practical problems, which, of course, is also begging the question. So <laughs> I'm not sure how productive that that exchange is going to end up being. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, let, let's thank uh, Sebastian Stein for a wonderful paper and really great responses. And thank you all for your engagement and participation today. It was a really great session and I look forward to the next one. We'll see you all next week. Thank you all. Thank you for everything. <laughs> Goodbye.